James, what did you think of the episode with uh, Mike from the Niche Twins? Uh, my internet sucked ass, but I think <laughs> hopefully always. it came out all right. Yeah. Uh, now, the episode episode was solid, man. I, what I really liked about it was diving into the Google penalty stuff. So, obviously, people follow Mike on Twitter when he was selling his site and he got hit with a manual penalty. And we dive into potentially why that happens. And I think the other big... Uh, I guess, uses his change of stance on the whole brand swapping method that he's been talking about for a while. Um, so anyone listening to that might find that very interesting. Yeah, that's great. And we we actually touched a bit on like um, diversifying and as well as like real estate, I believe, for a small segment for some reason. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure why we did that. I think I was just personally interested in like, the whole space because of current interest rate hikes, so on and so forth. But yeah, I think it was a good episode. I really enjoyed talking to him. We, him and I spoke via Twitter a couple of times, so it was good to finally meet him. It was, it was nice, man. Uh, if you guys are listening on, on YouTube, go on and just give this video a like, uh, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're growing nicely, but we're trying to go faster. This is like one of the slowest things I've ever grown. I, I have to be perfectly honest. Growing a podcast is so tough. So, guys, please just. It's probably because you can't you spam it with a million PBN links and whatever else. Yeah, I swear to God, if I could, I would, man. If I could, I would. All right, that's the episode. All right, go go listen to it um, and let us know what you think. Hopefully, it was all right. Hopefully, this internet is not that bad. But my bad, guys. My bad. But yeah, just like the video, anyways. Please. Thank you. What's good, everyone? It's Jackie Chow. And this is James DeLacy. And you're listening to This Week in Digital Marketing. What's good, everyone? It's Jackie Chow. Hey, guys. Uh, welcome to This, this Week in James Digital DeLacy. Marketing. My name's Jackie Chow. And My you're co-host listening is James to DeLacy. And joined marketing. with me today is Mike from the Niche Twins, Donovan. How's it going, Mike? Doing good. Yeah. Hey, hey, James. How's it going? That's good. Yeah. Yeah, all good, man. You you just had a big exit. Uh, we're I'm, we're going to talk all about that. Uh, and but first, I want to hear what you were up to now that you sold your site. Like, what's your week look like? What have you been up to? What are you working on? Yeah, so I I uh, prior to selling the site, when I had the site for about three years, I was working a nine to five. So I still got the full time job. I've got a uh, a son who's twenty months old. We got another baby coming in about twenty some odd days. And so my time is pretty well accounted for even prior to prior to having the site. But um, in terms of like the space that I was in when I before I sold the site, most of my time now is focused on niche twins, uh, specifically the newsletter side of it. Keith is focusing primarily on the SEO side of it, which is, you know, admittedly, it's a slower burn. There's less immediate feedback, at least with the newsletter. Like I can make money immediately. I can have, you know, people engage immediately. I can see open rates. So it's more, uh, there's more an immediate reaction there. Whereas SEO, as you know, is a lot slower. Um, so I've been enjoying the newsletter side of things. And then secondary to niche twins, I'm working on a blog that my wife started in the travel space, um, probably six or seven months ago now. Uh, she only oh, published great. about four total posts on that site, but it's already starting to take off. I mean, she got over a thousand pages with just those four posts. Uh, so it's promising. Oh, wow. um, and so I've got to lean into that uh, a bit more. I just have to find the time. So it's, um, it's mostly niche twins at the moment, but I will be doing kind of a 50, 50 split on that travel site and then niche twins. Hmm. All right. And since I haven't spoken to James in a while, Hey James, what are you up to this week? <laughs> Dude, I'm up to all the same stuff and more. I've got, man, I just keep filling my plate, eh? Just more and more shit. So the usual, yeah, you gotta be careful cranking there, man. the YouTube, cranking the, I know, man, cranking the sites. I've, I've got, so one thing we launched a, a membership for a professional jiu-jitsu athlete, me and a friend doing his marketing stuff. So he's got a community going and, and that's just going, well, I don't have to do too much for that. And then I have now taken on a brain supplement nootropic company and building their affiliate program. So if anyone's listening to this and is in the supplement space, fitness space, meditation, mindset, whatever, and wants to promote that, please, please get in touch. We're building that out. It's nice, juicy lifetime recurring commissions on that too. 
Mike, obviously you've exited your site, so you can just create a new site in that niche too, and you can promote it. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you've been very competitive. <laughs> and then I am, I've got a, I found a cheap as video editor, which has been awesome for a cash cow YouTube channel that is in the similar niche to the niche as my sites, but it's a different brand. And I'm just cranking that with like highlight videos to essentially build, oh. I guess, to extend an asset of another site that I acquired to do that. And oh, wait, Yo, can you talk about that? I completely no? forgot now. Yeah, sure. What do you want me to talk about? What are you posting on YouTube? Is it shorts or is it like long form? Uh... Both long form and shorts. So it's just, it's pure highlight videos of various athletes. 10 minute highlight video and then like four or five shorts from that video and i'm just fucking pumping those on to try to get like without my face do you get clapped with uh copyright issues on that because uh i'm sorry yeah it's on copyright one on one yeah. video yes but the other videos no so he, what he does is he just uploads it to a random channel and it checks if it gets copyrighted and if it doesn't then all good and if it does just cut those bits out so it's interesting i, I thought <laughs> i would just get smashed by copyright all the time but i've got four videos up now and only one of them, only like mm -hmm. the, one of the very first ones got copyrighted because we were kind of uh, playing with the ropes on that one. So, but the goal is to build that thing. So it's like an asset to the site that I acquired as I build mm -hmm. content on the other site too. And then it all comes back to my main site or I sell that site or whatever. And then the last piece is I'm talking to someone tomorrow that uh, I've known for a while about growing Twitter and having it, they're basically doing the same thing, almost like a fake, almost like a faceless Twitter, like a different brand within like health and oh. fitness and, but but posting shit that i wouldn't post on my own stuff like growth content stuff and then he's got a huge network of sites to help pump it basically and then funneling mm. that traffic back to my memberships and offers and whatever else so i'm just hmm. literally like Seems set up. i'm literally like yeah. all in on everything right now and that's yeah it's pretty it's pretty damn nuts but i'm, I'm hoping that it's just gonna it's all going to come just rushing in at once. It's all going to like just blow up and then not be good. That's, that's at least what I'm hoping for. <laughs> yeah, man, you got to learn how to juggle things. Um, yeah, that's what I need well, to I learn to, how to do <laughs> as well. Uh, I take on way too many things. Yo, uh, this week I am working on the paid side. Um, as I post, I mean, I'm sure you saw in the Slack channel that I've been running like Google ads into like landing pages. So Mike, I, I, I guess. I don't know mm. if you've tested this before, but like running, for example, if I rank for, or I want to rank for best, uh, I don't know, car battery. Um, and I would bid on that on <laughs> Google ads and then build out like a landing page specifically for car batteries. Um, but it's like a listicle, but it's not for SEO purposes. The main goal of this page is to get an outbound click into Amazon and just like secure mm. the cookie. Um, and yeah, I've been doing Dude, that for VPN. What was that ClickBank guy that used months? to do that? Yeah. Sorry? There was a ClickBank. What, there's a John. Uh, dude, there was a ClickBank guy, a famous ClickBank YouTube marketer dude. And that's what he would, he would give you. He would give you those pages on ClickFunnels. So he'd get you to sign up to ClickFunnels to promote his ClickBank make money online offers. And they were those. Mm -hmm. They were those listicle things that you would send traffic to. I can't remember his name. Oh, I see. Have you have you proven that yet, mm. Jackie? Did the did the economics of that work? Like the ad spend versus what you're making, or is it too early to tell if it's worth it? The economics for the VPN side definitely makes sense because um, every single click, if they as soon as they convert, is like like fifty to hundred dollars, right? Um, and each click is two dollars. So, so less what is than your $2. What, yeah, sorry, go what's the edge there? Is the edge finding the ad words that people aren't necessarily privy to yet and you're you're able to buy those for cheaper than other people? Exactly. Um, you're, you're betting on people not bidding on these long tail keywords and it'll be a couple, it'll be like less than 50 cents per click. But then, um, you're, for example, my Amazon rate is so high it's at a, such a high percentage that people won't even consider bidding on it. So, um, that, that's my, uh, idea. Gotcha. I've never proved, I haven't proven now the Amazon side though, because, uh, yeah, well, we'll see what happens here. The, uh, Amazon side will be tough to prove out because there's no API to actually bring it back to like report back to Google. So Google can't even optimize. 
So I'm like shooting in the dark right now. Um, yeah, trying to sort yeah. that out. Which is odd. I would assume Amazon has some sort of API that would link back the purchase, like conversion data, you know? Weird. Yeah, yeah so you can get we'll, that. We'll I mean, basically, it sounds like you're just relying on like sheer like spend versus revenue, right? Instead of mm -hmm. like maybe in between, maybe there's data there that you could look at. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think there's something there because, for example, someone who is actually searching for buyer intent keywords such as best, I don't know, car battery for uh, Ford F-150, uh, the buyer intent is there. So they're going to buy. It just depends on if they're going to buy it with your link or not, or they're, if they're going to bounce. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll keep everyone posted and we'll see what happens. Uh, yo, Mike, what do you, what do you do for your full-time you job, talking? by the way? So, Just like randomly. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so I'm a, yeah, yeah, no, that's all right. Um, so I work, I'm a program manager at a, a tech company here in Boston. So I work with engineers and product. We ship product to market and I work with those teams, you know, different programs. I'll have two or three different programs at a given time. And those programs could vary from, you know, the, the scope is, is quite different for each project. Um, but that's mm -hmm. my job. And that, that job was uh, partly in person in Boston for a period of time, pre-pandemic. And then post-pandemic, it went fully remote, uh, which has been, you know, amazing, right? Because I'm an hour south of the city. So now I save two, a little over two hours every single day. I just immediately got back, right? Uh, and so that's mm -hmm. where a lot of my ability to do some of the stuff online came from. Uh, but that's the that's the nine to five is a program manager at a tech uh, tech company in Boston. Oh, interesting. I would have guessed like you were in at least in marketing. Um, okay, interesting transition. <laughs> how did you find? No. Uh, yeah, how did you find start here in this industry? It's interesting. Yeah, um, there's so many resources out there. So I'm a big podcast person. So I, I've probably consumed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I couldn't quantify how many hours of podcasts I've listened to, but uh, early on, Pat Flynn and Niche Pursuit, so Spencer Hawes and what they were doing. And, er and like early in Pat Flynn's podcast, I don't listen to it much anymore, but early on, um, he was mostly blogging. Now he's got podcasts, he's got YouTube, he's really expanded what he was doing. Uh, but he was primarily at that time making money blogging. And, you know, at that time, I, I don't know what you guys thought of the word, even when you hear the word blogging or when someone says it to you, at least when I didn't know what it meant, I just thought it was like the lamest, not, you know, I admittedly, I thought it was lame. It was like, Hey, I'm gonna, you know, I'm at this restaurant. I'm doing this today. I didn't, I didn't yeah. understand how you would even monetize something like that. Um, and so hearing those guys say what they were making a month off of a blog uh, was kind of remarkable. So that's how I even got interested in doing it. And that's what, and then I heard, you know, later on, I came across uh, John Dykstra, and I think at the time okay. he was making ninety or a hundred thousand dollars a month blogging, and that's when I was finally like, I gotta at least just like play in that <laughs> space and see what happens. Yeah, that's wild. Um, okay, interesting come up story. You were in, on you were on niche pursuits as well, right? I was. Yeah, that was. Um, so my at that time that was about a little less than a year ago now. And so that was when my site had finally like really started to take off. I think at that first interview, it was just under $20,000 a month. Um, and so oh, nice. I had been on Twitter. I got my Twitter account just before they launched that episode because I was like, you know what? I have no, there's no way for anyone to reach me. So I might as well start a Twitter account and start talking about some of this stuff. So I got that mm -hmm. account right before they launched that channel. Um, and I just started talking about it publicly. Uh, and that's when, you know, from there, I just started sticking with it and then the site did better and better. And then there was a term, which we can talk about too, uh, right prior to selling, but, uh, that was how it all started. That was that interview. And then the site was obviously sure. doing very well at that time. Great. Great. Yo, my, I think your, uh, mic is like brushing against your, uh, so there's a better oh, background noise. That. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I got, I got this feedback from the neat, from, uh, Spencer and Jared. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah yeah all good all good um yeah holy cow yeah great i mean you got a huge boost right from the niche pursuits podcast how many do you, do you remember how many followers you got from that because i know i got a couple hundred there yeah i don't 
Yeah, I think it was probably around that. It really wasn't, um, it wasn't necessarily, I don't think that platform that really got me the followers on Twitter. I think as you know, Jackie, one of the, one of the great things about being, there's a big stigma around sharing like income, right? Uh, for whatever reason. But for me, when it came to online income, I just didn't feel the same hesitation. Like I don't feel comfortable even right now talking about my nine to five salary, even though that's less than what I was making online, but I felt very comfortable sharing what I was making online. Um, and for whatever reason, if you shared those results, plus how you did it, people were very interested in that. So I think that was really the key thing was I was open about what I was doing, how much I was making, and just consistently sharing that. Um, and that was really where most of that growth came from. People are interested in numbers for the most part. Mm -hmm. You need to tell us as well, what, how come you're still working a full-time job with this big exit, with making that much online and having basically having another site in the works and things like that, and your niche twins time to grow as well? Yeah. Yeah. Also, yo, the, um, the job sorry, is... Your job. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, but it, did you um did you just sign a mortgage? Did you um sign a mortgage? Yeah, I did. Um, Congrats, man! Congrats. I did. I guess so that's one of the on reasons. The first, thank you. Yeah, on the first point, I I kept the job I have now because it's a it's a great job, it's a good paying job, um, and I have the flexibility like we talked about before, where a lot of it is remote, uh, and so I I get that time back in my day. So I actually, you know, it's one of those jobs where it's not like I wake up every morning, like can't wait to go to work, but I also enjoy it to some extent, which is like, in my opinion, it's like all this talk about, oh, you got to find your passion is kind of BS. If you feel good about waking up and you don't have like the Sunday scaries and stuff like that, I think that's a huge win. And that's how I feel about this job. That's one piece of it. Another big piece of it is I hadn't, I still haven't got the real estate that I want to buy. So whether it's personal or investment, and in, in the U.S., it's very difficult to acquire, mm -hmm. to buy real estate unless you have all cash or you have multiple years of W-2 showing solid income back to back to back. There are some lenders that will work with you, uh, but it's very challenging. And so your, your options are limited. And so I had multiple people reach out and say like, hey, get the real estate you want before you ever consider quitting. There's the, the healthcare side of it too, where we want to have our like our kids first and just make sure that we're, you got, we have the best coverage that we can, which my company offers. And so there's multiple considerations there. Um, but I feel like I have enough wiggle room where I can kind of enjoy doing both at the moment. Uh, I think at one point I will get to a point where I don't want to work the job anymore. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I, I personally, uh, I thought I stuck along uh, around for too long, but that was only like a year and a half into like full time hustle. Um, yeah, I think my my rule of thumb was like two years of emergency funds plus you were making double what you're making at your full time job, and you easily do that, right? Uh, but I think if you're arguing the mortgage, I think that 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 is something. Um, yeah, I, I guess if you like your job. It's fine. It's fine. As long as, as long as there's no opportunity cost, right? Cause maybe there's a world where you will make way more, uh, if you just quit your job and focus on other things. Right. Do you think there's an argument there or is there, that, that is the hard part. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. I think that's a very valid argument, which is <laughs> if you just stop doing your job and focused a hundred percent on this other thing, would you see outsized returns? I think that's a great argument. Um, I want to get to that point. I think I'm pretty close. Like we're, we're getting through, like we just signed. So we're in the house that we're in now. We're going to rent this house out um, and we're going to move into another house. And I don't think there's any like near term stuff we're going to do beyond that in, in probably the next five years or so. And so I think there's a window there where perhaps I do, I take that leap. Um, but for now, it's not like, it's not a priority, put it that way. But I, I hear you. I do think there's an opportunity cost to answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what do you plan? Okay. So you just finished, uh, you just closed on your site. Um, where are you putting your money besides the real estate that you just purchased? I guess it's a house, another detached home in Boston area, or is it like an Airbnb? Yeah. So it's, yeah. 
so there so this house both homes are lake houses so this house is on a lake that we bought um this Sick. is an hour south of boston nice and we loved when my wife and i bought this we were like you know we didn't have any kids and we were like let's let's get a house that's a lot of fun it's got like a hot tub an outdoor shower it's got you know we have a pontoon boat out there it's like a fun setup but it's on a cliff uh and so it's sure. not a kid-friendly house like whatsoever <laughs> Uh, so, so we had our first son, uh, and very quickly the house got small. It's a thousand square feet. And so we just kept, you know, we're like, let's find a house that's somewhere else that has more space. And we still want to stay on a lake, but it's very hard to find, you know, there's only so many lakes in, in the state that I'm in. And there's only, only so many lakes that lakes that are like fully recreational where you can swim, boat, fish, and do all the things we wanted to do. Long story short, we just resided ourselves to, we're not going to find that house. So let's just find a house we love that has a great yard. Um, and it all worked out in the end. I mean, we looked for almost a year. And about mm. two weeks ago, a family friend reached out saying that they knew somebody that had a house in my hometown on a lake, oh, you great. know, had the space, the yard, everything. And so that's so that yeah. will become our primary residence. We'll turn this into a rental because we got this in 2019 when the mortgage rate on this house is like 2.8%. And so it's very hard to give that up. Like you can make a house like this cash flow just because the rates are so low. Um, and so mm -hmm. we just felt like if we could make that work and keep this and try to rent it, that was what we wanted to do. How long did you fix the interest rate for in 2019? 30 years. Nice. So sick. So sick. Yeah, you could totally make a cash flow then. Yeah. Um, but I, I saw on Twitter, uh, for, forgive me if I'm... Uh, wrong here, but it was was it five percent that you fixed for your your the the, no, the new place? So, so that's the next house, yeah. So totally. So the house that we are looking at now, because obviously it's a very different environment um, for both just interest rates and home prices. Uh, we so rates were about three days ago mid sixes. I was able to yeah. get an offer for five nine nine on Sunday. Um, this whole Silicon Valley bank debacle, uh, and the fed stepping in actually made the market believe that they're going to, they're going to minimally pause hiking rates and probably slow, you know, who knows if rates will fall further, but I imagine they will. And so that was good for me because both the, both lenders came back with an offer. I, I think we landed on five, six, two, five, uh, which is still mm -hmm. hard to stomach given where our mortgage is on this house now. Yeah. Um, but that was that was significantly better monthly. But if you look at it, the way I think about it is that's a 30 year mortgage. And we put up, you know, a decent amount of a down payment, call it 35 percent for a down payment. You, you either believe that you can make more than the interest on that loan, investing it somewhere else, or you don't. If you believe you can make more, then you keep as much cash as you can and go put that to work and try to make more. If you don't believe you can, maybe you put more cash into the home. I didn't like that for that reason. I also didn't like it because all my cash would be tied up in a house. And then, you know, I could yeah. take out, you know, maybe a home equity line of credit. I could do a number of things, but then you, you, you have less, less flexibility, right, to do stuff. Hmm. So that's what's what's your argument? Yeah, yeah. But you did a fixed interest rate, right, as well for this one? Yes. Yes. Hmm. Huh. Most people right now are doing variable, um, but yeah, that's okay. Okay. I guess you just like to know. In my mind, uh, the only case, reason. Yeah. yeah the, the only reason in my mind, a variable rate makes sense. So typically they'll do five, seven year arm variable rates where you lock in for that period of time. And then it depends. They'll do a one or a two, which means either the rate changes once a year or twice a year. Um, and so and that's after that period of time is up. So it'll float to the rate that it is at that time. So after five or seven years, if the rate goes up, you'll come up to that rate. Now, most of them say it goes up 2%. You're not going to jump necessarily up that 2% right away. They might incrementally get you there. Um, but that really doesn't make a ton of sense unless your, like, your goal is to stay in that house for a shorter duration. For me, mm -hmm. if I lock in a 30-year now, I can refinance tomorrow. Say the rates go down to, um, you know, I think rates might go down in the next, you know, six months. I would refinance early and just lock it in at like maybe four or something 
and get it for 30 years. I mm. like the certainty of knowing what my rate is. And I like knowing what my monthly payment is. I also love the idea of paying off year 20, 21, 22, 23 with cheaper dollars. You know what I mean? Like I'll pay for today's dollars, but my expectation is that dollars are going to be cheaper in the future. And so I'm getting kind of a little bit more for my money in that sense. Um, so that's how, that's at least how I, I think about it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that, I'm just personally interested in this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I see James is dying on the side. He, he doesn't even care about interest rates at all, do you, James? <laughs> no, no, I've been I've been listening to a lot of real estate shit because I'm I'm starting to look about because we, we want to buy here in Austin. I was actually talking to a private lender last last oh, week because okay. obviously I'm self employed. Yeah. Perfect. So having yes. having to go through the self-employed stuff they're saying like they go by the two two year average of your net income and they want to see it grow and all that kind of shit so i'm just literally they were saying like you know uh, limit your business expenses and stuff because you want a high net income but right now i'm like fuck that i'm going hard so i'm just like smashing business expenses because i can just make more money and then mm -hmm. do that in the future <laughs> so it's, yeah. i'm just trying to trying to get there quickly and just get the cash flowing and then see from there but yeah being self-employed makes it a little a little more difficult yeah that was that was the point in case of why i kept my nine to five that i just didn't want to deal with. it feels easier to just like you know i'm 32 i can kind of get what i need now and then when i decide if i decide to take that leap i won't need to you know i won't feel dependent on someone giving me a loan basically yeah gotcha and there's negatives Yo, too, right? Um, there's upside to being working for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Hey, Mike. Um, so let's talk about your exit now, man. Uh, I've been dying to hear about it. Uh, I don't know how much you revealed on your newsletter. I, you're, you actually sent it out um, before I, w I signed up or before I was able to sign up. So I wasn't able to see it. Uh, I feel bad. I'm embarrassed for even saying that. But how much did you reveal? Like, how much can you reveal? Yeah, I, I can reveal, I, I chose to say high six figures, but it's, you know, if you just work backwards from what I've said, you could figure it out. Um, so the site was listed for 700 and it ended up selling for 800. So it was about 15% over asking. Um, I think the reason yeah. I got lucky in the sense that I had a manual penalty from Google and that penalty got lifted two days after we decided to lift it publicly. And this was, we had previously, we had an offer for, low seven figures, um, but that penalty plus traffic declined between 40 and 50% between the three months that that buyer's SBA loan process took. And then they got spooked, mm -hmm. they backed out. I had Quiet Light listed publicly for 700. Someone was, you know, multiple buyers were actually interested in above asking offers. And then the one that we took was, was at 800. Um, and then that was cash only. So that was how we structured it is, I didn't want to go through the loan, the SBA process again. I wanted like a quick close. I also, we're trying to buy a house. We have a baby coming in 20. I was like, I can't be doing all three of these things at the same time. And so it would be great to get this out of the way, be able to buy a house and then have this baby in 20 days or some odd days. That's great, man. Um, 800, what, what, what is that multiple on like a trailing 12 average? Is that... So pretty on, high, this, right? on my site, it, that was low. It? No, it was actually pretty low. Um, so it was like 2.2, uh, which was, okay. so the 700 was 2.2. So I don't know what it would be for the 800, what we ended up getting. Mm -hmm. um, but I did that intentionally because the trailing 12 is not really a fair representation of where my site was when we listed it. My site had dropped from a high of 780,000 page views in August to a low of about 350, 355 by the time I sold it. It was still making five figures uh, in January and February. And those months are the worst for display ads. And my site was primarily monetized with display ads. But given where the traffic was and given where what I was making at that time, you know, to do a 12 month trailing just in the penalty, mind you, I had the penalty. I didn't know it was going to get lifted two days after I listed it. Uh, and so I wanted one to ensure that we would get interest and get offers and to be realistic mm -hmm. about where the site was. And so that's why we relisted it at a lower multiple on the 12 year trailing, but a fair multiple based on where we were in the moment. 
Yeah, yeah. Did you end up selling to a private equity company? No, so so it was actually an individual. Um, and, and most wow. people I spoke to were individuals. Um, I spoke to a couple partners who had businesses in the space that I was in, uh, but almost exclusively everyone I spoke to were individuals that had cash. <laughs> wow, there's some rich people there, huh? Yep. Yeah, I think I, I can tell you it was a great there's, time there's to There's more sell. money out <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Um, but there's a lot of money. There's a lot more money out there than I think most people appreciate. Uh, at least I'm always made aware of that. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Did you write all your content for that site, by the way? Or am I re remembering incorrectly? Yeah, I wrote, I wrote probably 90 plus percent of the content on that site. I tried for a period of time in the middle to hire some people and I did. Um, it was difficult to retain writers. It was hard to get quality writers. I found myself doing a lot of the editing and doing a lot of work anyway. Uh, and so I ended up just dropping that off and doing most of it myself. So yeah, I'd say 90 plus percent of the content on that site I, I wrote personally. Okay. Huh. All right. Um, if, if you were to sell like at its height, at the site's height, I, I know you shouldn't think like that, but like, what kind of multiples would you, are you or what, what kind of, would you be like well into the seven figures? Um, I, f I forgot what your highest. Yeah. So the, was. the, uh, sure. So the, the offer that I got in August, which would have been site was like on a tear. It was doing very well in August. I think it made 43,000 in that month. The offer that I got that fell through was 1.265 million. Um, and so I think that's probably, that was a fair, you know, probably a little bit given the trajectory of the site and how well it was doing, it was probably a little bit high even. Um, but I don't think I would have got much more than that. That was what their offer was. Uh, and that was the deal that fell well, through at bad. that time. The, the site hadn't been doing better than that. Yeah. The difference ended up not being, you know, if, if I hadn't had that offer, I would have been thrilled about the 800, but of course I had that benchmark <laughs> of like, wow, you know, a seven figure deal. And then to have the painful process of watching my site decline while I was waiting for their loan to work out for three months. Uh, that was an extremely painful period of time uh, to have that happen. But the outcome, no matter how I look at the outcome, it was a positive outcome. Uh, but I wish I just never got that offer in the first place. Uh, but no, it was good. It was a positive thing. All right. Yeah, that's good to hear. Yo, um, how, like when, when, when you disclosed that your site got hit, how come there, there was this one guy on Twitter that was giving you shit? Who, who, who is that guy? Like code guy? What's up with that? What, yeah, what's up with you guys? Actually, Are you guys, you guys have a falling I, out? I, I thought know. you guys were cool. No. So I, I don't even know him like by any measure. Um, I don't know what he does. Oh. I don't know who he is. I did follow him at one point cause he had, he had some interesting stuff around content sites. Um, that was one of the tough things is like, I mean, there's like 30, you know, 30,000 some odd people that are, that I, that follow me. And there was like him. It was basically the only person who was being very vocal about the fact that my site was declining, which by the way, that happens in this space. It's not something necessarily you can avoid. Yeah. Your site doesn't go up forever. People have sites that go up and down. It's part of the game. It's difficult to handle, I'll admit. that. Like The emotional roller coaster of having that happen is, is challenging. Um, but I don't know who that guy is. He, he had a, like, it was a crazy thread that he put together of, like, he called me a narcissist in it. He said, uh, he said I stole his keywords, which like, how do you steal someone's keywords? I mean, it's as if like you could own the keywords on Google. <laughs> um, it was very odd. And then he ended up deleting that thread. Um, but it, it was his way of like, I, I don't know, some people take joy in when they see someone that's doing well and then something turns against that person. You know, he took joy in that moment, not knowing that like my site was still doing very well. It just wasn't doing, you know, the 43,000 a month that it was doing previously. Uh, but that was very odd. I have to get better about when I see stuff like that, just block it. it. It does bother me and I wish it didn't, but that's like one tiny part of Twitter. Um, and it did bother me. Like half my day was like ruined by what that guy said. And I don't even know who he is or why he said it. 
Um, but I got to get better about that. Yeah, what, what was he the always Google seems like before? a nice guy. Sorry, go ahead. No, so say what what was the um what was the Google penalty for, Mark? Yeah, so the the penalty specifically was uh in uh, unnatural inbound links for some pages. Uh in that last part, that mm. distinction is important because that penalty can apply to your entire site as well. So there's two forms of that penalty. Uh Google didn't provide any context as to what pages. Uh, so it was completely useless to me. I just get an alert in my Google search console that, hey, some pages we see are suspicious for having inbound links, but they didn't give me any context as to what. Um, and so I ended up hiring outside help because, you know, I don't know a lot about doing link audits or figuring out like which, you know, some sites are clearly spammy and other sites it's hard to tell. Uh, but long story short, they did a big disavow file disavowed a bunch of links and then four months later we heard nothing for four months and then it got lifted right after i listed the site publicly for sale Man, that's so annoying um you worked with quite a bit of uh these uh was it penalty experts right who did you who helped the most in the end give them a shout out yeah so i so I want to, I'll say, I'll shout out the person who I hired because they did a great job. His name's Chris from Penalty Hammer. So people that are in this space, they know Rick Lomas. Rick Lomas is like the guy. When it, you have a penalty, you go to him. I reached out to him. He was on vacation and he's like, hey, reach out to Chris at Penalty Hammer. I'm not going to be back for a week. And so Chris was great. So penaltyhammer.com, I think is his URL. He's fantastic. I'm not going to say the other two because the other two were super generous with their time. And they reached out to me for free and said, hey, I'm sorry mm -hmm. that this is happening to you. You know, I'd love to look into it for you. What was interesting, though, about that experience was they're both very experienced. One of them told me uh, in like not so many words that no matter what I said, I was lying and that I had bought these links that she had shared with me, which I had never seen in my life. Uh, and that, you know, it is what it is. It's a good learning experience. And most people in your circumstances should walk away from your website. Mind you, I sold it for, you know, oh, high six <laughs> figures. I sold it for high six figures about four or five months hmm. later. Um, but they, they just believed that the site was tarnished because I had clearly bought links based on their analysis of the links that they saw. I was so, so it, it bothered me that that was the approach that they took. I sent back, I actually emailed hmm. the webmasters of the sites that they shared with me saying, hey, you bought these links. And I, I started thinking, like, did someone buy these links pretending to be me as, like, a negative SEO attack? Like, I, my brain was just spinning on it. And so I just said, hey, yeah. here's the link. Did someone buy this? And they got back to me, and they're like, no, no one bought this, but I'll gladly remove it if you'd like me to. And I said, don't, you know, don't remove it. Just wanted to double check. Uh, and I forward that to this person, and they kind of went a little silent on it. But, again, I – those people, both those people, so I, I reached out to three people, or actually two reached out to me. I paid one. They were using their own time to help me. So I have nothing ill will against them. It was just fascinating yeah, yeah. to see all three of them had different opinions about what happened. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder what the approach would be here. I've never, I, I, I've, I've gotten a couple of manual penalties, but I, I granted, I, I use the dirtiest tactics. Like I use them all, man. Uh, but <laughs> on my, not, not, not on my big sites though, not on my big sites. So uh, these are like, just like starter sites that I just would completely pound with the dirtiest links and it would, it would get, it would get up there. And for example, I don't know if you guys know the space, but I was able to hit like number one for the keyword 360 camera. That was such a crazy keyword. It was like, like mid five figures a month, just on that one keyword. It was so nice. Um. But then, yeah, just that, by that's doing the one that these out. like spammy, yeah, yeah that's yeah. wild. So the thing that was crazy is, like you just said, like you owned it. You're like I, you know, I kind of deserved it almost. In my case, it was three years of not doing <laughs> anything with links, and I reached out to this company called LinkBuilder.io, and you know, it is what it is. I, I put this out there as like a caution to people. They yeah. charge three thousand dollars a month. And at this point in my website's history, I was like, you know what? I want to build a moat. My DR is a bit low. My site's killing it. But the thing that I'm lacking is some quality links. And I, you know, I know links are important. The way you get them matters, obviously. 
And they assured me that they weren't going to buy links. I get eight links back for the first month. They are garbage, like truly terrible sites. Even to someone like me that doesn't know what I'm doing. I look at these sites on Ahrefs, you know, your DR, like if you organically grow a website, your DR kind of grows naturally over time. There might be spikes mm -hmm. and falls, but nothing crazy. When you clearly manipulate the DR of a website, it's like this spike, 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 spike. Like you can tell they're just throwing like crappy websites to get the DR up and every single site. And when you went to visit the site, they were garbage. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I ended up talking to, I think the founder of that company, they gave me a full refund and they rescinded the links within 20 days. Now, one person, the, per the other person who reached out to me and gave me their time for free, I actually think their theory might be correct, which is perhaps me getting those links was a red flag because they were spammy. And then me removing them so quickly was another quick trigger that somehow sent something off to somebody, at, you know, the manual reviewers at Google that was like, there's hmm. something going on here. We can't quite tell what's going on. So there might be some credence to that. Who? It's a black box. You have no idea. But it pissed me off that like the one time that I even ventured into <laughs> like links and I wasn't even trying to be shady about it. I just get slammed with a penalty. Um, and so I, I don't know if that that's a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. I'm like, you know, maybe partially by being so public on Twitter, you know, it's not hard to find my site. If you really want, I didn't share it, but you don't have to try that hard to like figure out what it was. Um, and so I don't know. I think there, there's something there that I'm not quite, I'll, I don't know if I'll ever know exactly what happened there, but uh, not a good experience. And by the way, I can't tie the penalty to those links. I'm just thinking that's the only thing I did. Um, you know, so I don't know. I wonder if it could be should, like uh, negative SEO. Sponsor, though. Jackie, that's a good segue. Yeah, should, should we do the ad read now? Yeah, you think? Yeah, I mean, we could. Yeah, do it. Um, do it. Yeah, sorry, Mike, you got to sit through this. Uh, got to pay the bills. Uh, you know how it is. You, you'll, you'll get into the newsletter. We can, we can speak about newsletter it. sponsorships, actually. That's it's a interesting space we're in. But anyways, yeah, uh, sponsor this week, rhinorank.io. Um, great people. I know the founder quite well, one of the, uh, one of the co-founders quite well, based in the UK, all UK based team. Um, yeah, I, they're, they're part of the public case study that I'm doing for the link building, spent a, a grand 1.x K with them. Uh, pretty expensive, got the report back. They're pretty good. Um, yeah, most people would say they're pretty good. They're they're not like jaw droppingly good, but for the price, honestly, value it's great. Um, they have a good customer service. And they have they warranty got... on the links, man. Yeah, I think that's big because um, as a link seller myself, man, some of these guys are the worst, man. You you pay them, place the link, and they think you're not watching. They just remove it after three months. It's so annoying. But yeah, these guys have the twelve month warranty, so you you, you know they got it down for you. Um, also, I've heard this guy, he's like grabbing his hair all the time because he's got a money back guarantee as well. Uh, there's a ton of Karens in the link building mm -hmm. space, man. I'm, I'm looking through our personal tickets right now. <laughs> Even well-known people are typing in all caps, like relax, we'll, we'll refund you. Like just chill. All right. Like it's, <laughs> it's not a big deal. You know, we'll remove it. It's not a big deal. Like you, you didn't send us any requirements. We get your links placed. And then you're just like yelling at us through text. And it's, it's only because they think they're speaking to a customer service rep. But anytime that happens, they just forward it to me. So I see, I'm like, dude, it's just why, Jackie why that's like talking this? to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, why are you like this, man? Uh, but yeah, anyways, uh, it's, it's, it's good to have a money back guarantee just to make sure that if you want to be a Karen, you get your money back. Um, so yeah, runrank.io, get, get, use your, use the coupon code indexy to get, uh, I think it was like 10% off. Yeah, that's it. That's the ad read. So Mike, you said you'll never touch another link building Mike, company again. You will you? So no, I didn't say that. Um, I, I, I think you have to do, it depends on what the links are and how they go about getting those links. In this case, you know, be a Karen all day long because these people were just being lazy and they were clearly just like spamming these sites, getting high DR, in selling a high ticket service for garbage. Um, I think there's a way to do it where you can do it correctly and people do it correctly all the time. 
Uh, and so I'm not, I'm not completely out of that game uh, of potentially looking at that, but I do think there's a way where you can grow a site organically. You don't need links right away, depending on what space you're in. So obviously if you're in casinos, a, you know, a, a finance type space, you're going to get killed forever unless you have links. And so you can't just ignore that. But there's a lot of niches where you don't need links. Uh, I've proven that. And there's other, you know, plenty of other people that have proven that. But no, I'm not completely out of that space. I just, I've had one bad experience with it. It doesn't mean I'll never touch it again. Um, but I'll, yeah. I'll definitely be a lot smarter about like due diligence and stuff like that. Yeah. Man, you must be the most unlucky person on earth. You should see like how many links we build a month for our sites. It's crazy. Uh, especially for the new ones. Because we, we have like huge, uh, That's what, what is it? Inventory of links, right? Yeah. That's why I don't, you know, again, I don't believe in coincidences and I have no idea what really happened. Um, do I think that there's a possibility that because I was a bit more public than most folks are, with their sites that that could have had something to do with it. I do like, what are the odds that of all the websites out there on Google, how many websites exist that mine that had this one experience with links gets hit with a manual penalty. I, I just don't, it's, it doesn't really compute to me. And I know some of the stuff that people are doing out there, which I'm of the opinion, like if you can make it work, I, who cares how you do it, if it works. Now, longevity is a question. Um, and I think for some people, they care. And some people are like crash and burn. And who cares? You can make money on the way up. Uh, I, I just like the idea of making money with websites. And so how you do it, I don't care. Um, but I do think there's something to that. Like, what are the odds that I got hit with yeah. eight links? Uh, and who knows if those were even the eight links, you know? Yeah. Did you, did you see um, someone like a referral from Raider Hub before you got your penalty? On Google it's, it's funny because you had tweeted, I think, I think you had shared something about like seeing Raider Hub come to your site. I had, yeah. I have to go, I actually don't have access anymore because I hand it all over, but I had had a bunch of hits from Raider Hub, like for many months uh, in a row. And I'm trying to, I can't remember what months they were, but they had totally visited my site for sure. They were on the site. It was clear uh, that they had been there. And I had only looked because you had said something like, hey, I didn't even know what Raider Hub was, to be honest with you. Um, but then, you know, you can look for it and they were there. I don't know if it was right before. I don't think it was like right before I got hit, but there's something to that. I, I don't know quite what it was. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm just trying to unpack the, the manual penalty. So after you got the penalty, was your site downhill from there? Cause I remember it was stable after you got the penalty, right? Or was it like an immediate hit? It, it wasn't immediate. And this is the thing that's tough too, is because I, I don't think it was all, I don't think the traffic decline that I experienced was a hundred percent attributed to just this manual penalty. I got hit in August mm. with the penalty or sorry, October. Uh, and my traffic was like in the seven hundreds for like three months. And then around like no, the end of November ish. So like between August and October sites in the seven hundreds, what hit a peak of seven eighty and then flatlined. Um, and then it went from like there to about 350 over the course of four and a half months. And so shortly after I got the penalty at the end of October, traffic started to decline. But I just find it, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm not like an SEO expert. I don't, I'm not an expert on, you know, updates, but it's probably a combination of that manual action plus Google's been like, there was the helpful content update. There was the link spam update. Um, there was a number of other updates during that time as well. The thing that I didn't see, which I think you would expect to see with an algorithm update is like a three or four day drop where traffic very clearly just goes from like one level down 20% or down 30%. That never happened with my site. It just, if you look at the graph, it, it looks like quick, but it's actually over the course of four and a half months where it just grinds lower and lower and lower. And some of my competitors that are in my space, they went from like 1.5 million. This is on HF, so that's always wrong. Mm -hmm. So consider it much higher <laughs> in my opinion, but 1.5 million down to like 300,000 in like four days. That is a clear algorithm. Like they adjusted them and they're down yeah. to where that, that spot is. Um, 
And so it's hard to tell. I, I'm not an expert in that. I don't, I don't know what caused it, but probably a few things. Okay. Okay. Um, did the same update hit uh, Keith by any chance? Or was it different? No. Timing? So Keith's site. Cause um, his site got hit too, right? Yeah. Very That's different. Messed up, man. His site yeah. got, his site got crushed. So he, he actually, what he did was insane. I was actually, it's crazy how his site grew. So he went from um, nothing to within six months, over 50,000 page views, just by writing all the content, hundred percent himself, no link building. So he did like a hundred plus articles in the period of six months, got to 50,000 views, was oh. making close to, close to like 2,500, $3,000 a month. And then like two weeks after that, his site just went from there to like ghost town. Um, and then the worst part is that that went on for a little bit. And then a couple of weeks later, all his traffic came back again. Uh, and then a couple of weeks after that, it got killed again. Um, and so, and I know, here's the thing is like, yes, I'm biased. Obviously he's my brother. The content was very good. If you look at like comparatively to what he was competing against, it was solid content. It was all unique content that he had wrote, uh, had written. Um, it was an age mm. domain. Um, also the site had no links whatsoever. So it was like, basically like, I think I linked to him. Like <laughs> it was like the link that he got. Um, and so I, you know, who knows what caused that, but that site has not come back, uh, since. Um, and so, wow. yeah, that's been, it's been, that's been an interesting experience is like, I think I had sort of the Goldilocks experience with the website as my first site, like a year was mm. pretty quiet. Uh, and I didn't know what, like what to expect. I just kept kind of sticking with it. And then year two, it just like exploded. And when you're going up, you actually DM me, Jackie. I don't know if you remember this. Um, oh, yeah, I DM remember. I, I DM a lot of people. Twitter, I'm like, yo, you should. You, I, I yeah. DM a lot of people when it's like, you said when, sell, man. when I notice it. Yeah. I should, yeah. yeah. I typically yeah. T tell people. <laughs> and you were right, that. by the way. I would have, I would have got a better valuation because at that time, and you know, you, some of these things you have to experience for yourself, right? Like, like day trading, yeah. everyone told me like <clears throat> 90, you know, 97% of people lose <clears throat> money, but I heard, you know, 3% of people make money. That's going to be me. But you, you, some of these things you just have to learn. Um, and in this case, I was like, you know what? The site's going up. I'm doing well. This is going to work out for me. You DM me and you're like, dude, now is the time to consider selling it. If I had, if I had listened to you, I would have got probably the better valuation at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is only from trading crypto and stocks. Um, cause you got euphoric on the way up. I still get that totally. with new sites. I'm not, I, I still get that. But now I'm able to identify at least in other people and like the, the, the feeling of euphoria, like secondhand euphoria, so to speak. And I just message them. I'm like, yo, please it's just sell, <laughs> um, at least, at least one of them, you know, I don't know if you have m multiple sites, but like, if you had a multiple sites, I'd be like, just sell it. And I would try to talk them, like talk sense into people like, Hey, uh, what percentage of your net worth is tied up? I think I had a, a similar conversation, right? It's like what percentage of your net worth is tied yeah. up in the valuation of this one business is all the thing I tell, yep, tell most totally. people. <laughs> and if and it's you, more than 90%, I'm like, that. dude, think, just sell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 90% is crazy. It wasn't 90%. Um, if it was 90%, yeah. that's like your whole life is into that one thing. But it was significant. But when we had spoken, it's funny though, there, there is something about noticing it in someone else, right? Like, yeah. I, you know, I think the only thing I've ever tweeted about on, on my account was when Meta was getting hammered and everybody on Twitter was piling on this company. The, I, my tweet's still up there. I said, now would be a good time to buy. It was at $99. I didn't even listen to my own advice. <laughs> the, the thing went up a hundred, you know, it's that was that like almost $200 now, but it's like, you're able, there's this weird thing where you're emotionally able to remove yourself a little bit. And if you could just be that version of yourself, you'd be a billionaire, right? Because you're, it's like, I know, like I can, I can sense the euphoria. I can sense the people, the dismay where people are super fearful, but it's not me. I'm a little bit dissociated from it. It's not my money. Uh, and so you can make these calls where it's like, it's so obvious almost. Uh, but when it's your money, you're just like, oh, you know, I don't know. Is this the right time? Should I do this? Uh, but there is something to that. If you could be that person, that version of yourself, 
I think you'd do very well over over a long period of time. Jackie, I'm just going to yeah. jump in here a sec. I want to yeah, please. come come back to that actual Google penalty, Mike. I think a lot of people, I guess you've become well known for the brand swapping technique, which you've coined. How, I guess with Keith's side and even your side, I think probably it's probably one of the most common. I think that's what I saw people comment about on Twitter as well. But would you put any of that down to using that brand swapping for getting hit? Yeah, so it's so it's, it's difficult to say. If you look at what the article that I have up, I just did an interview with Niche Pursuits. I don't think it'll come out before this because they take a little longer. Um, but I do think now my opinion has changed on that approach quite a bit. And the article that I have put mm. up, there's a disclaimer at the very mm. top, which basically summarizes what, what I'll say in a minute, which is if you if you know that Google values unique content, you should probably rewrite it. And that's how I feel now. Uh, I still, Mm. there's still no evidence that like, yes, clearly Google is penalizing that approach, but we know that they value unique content. And so if that means, even though if the con, if the section of that article is the same thing or the same fix and word for word makes sense, I think you should take the Mm -hmm. extra step now of rewriting it. And part of me is because I don't know what caused the site to get hit like specifically, but I do know one thing's in my control, which is taking the extra effort to rewrite it. And so I think the brand swapping method is still valuable in that it can give you in brand swapping method, by the way, that's programmatic SEO. I didn't come up like the, the idea that I came yeah, up yeah. with was just like, you're not using software to help you. It was just like as an individual contributor myself working by myself, not on a team, here's how to think about programmatic SEO for yourself, not th- something I invented. And there's a lot of that programmatic sites that are killing it still. Um, and so, but I just think if you can, if you can reduce the reasons for Google to hit you, it's worth that effort. And so my stance on brand swapping has changed quite a bit. The site that I had, um, at, you know, by the time I sold it, it was probably like 20% of my traffic was attributed to doing that. Um, so it wasn't nothing. Um, but it's just impossible to know like what specifically caused it. But I'm, I think mm. you should be conservative. I think that's the approach you should take it these days. If, you, if you're trying to have a site that lasts for a long period of time, I would just take the effort, rewrite it, and you can get, you can use brand swapping to come up with uh, the different brands and the different keywords, which is super valuable, right? You find a keyword for a brand, use that same thing and swap out the brand. You, you probably just found 10 or 15 other keywords to write for. And by the way, mm-hmm. your research is done once but you're going to rewrite it mm-hmm. because I just don't think it's worth taking the risk of having the same content uh, when we don't know. So that's the approach that we take now. All right. All right. Are you, are you going to use, uh, so what are you, what are you working on now? You mentioned your wife's uh, travel site. Is that correct? And niche twins. That's like the two things you're going to focus on hard after, uh, after work, of course. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I think, I wrote about this a little bit, but I think I think the key thing is, and people will roll their eyes at this because they've been saying it forever, but it's one of those another one of those lessons you have to learn for yourself. Um, I think the long tail keyword site where you're just going after someone typing into Google and finding you is the only way they would ever share your site or find your site. I think that can still make a ton of money, but I don't know how long the life of lifespan of that's going to be. Uh, And I think there's multiple reasons for that. I think a big reason is AI. I don't know a lot about AI, but I do know you're effectively being squeezed from two sides. You have content creators who are using ChatGPT to lower the barrier to creating content. So you're being squeezed there. And then you uh, you have search engines like Bing and Google putting it into their search engine amongst a billion other things that are pushing you down in the SERPs, which they were already doing. Right. So you're just being Mm -hmm. squeezed uh, from both sides from this new technology. And, you know, you could have said when I started my site that long tail keyword sites that only exist to get SEO traffic wouldn't make it either. Uh, I'm not saying tomorrow that those are going to die. I just don't know how much time they have left. And if I'm going to spend my time working on something now, I want to spend it on the thing that everyone that's in this space for more than five years says, which is you got to diversify. You can't be sitting on a one-legged stool. You got to be, you have to have a newsletter. You have to have direct traffic. You have to have SEO traffic. You have to have social profiles. You need to build something 
that can actually withstand getting kicked or bumped into. When you're sitting on like SEO traffic, you can do that for a long time. Uh, and then eventually you're going to get knocked over because that's the only thing that you have. And so if, if nothing else, like that first site was a good lesson in that because once things turn, it's like, there's nothing to soften the blow. I don't have an email list. I don't have direct traffic. I don't have social profiles. And by the way, my niche was very hard to do those things for. You could do them. I started to do a little bit, uh, but it wasn't a good fit for a lot of those. So that's what, so to answer your question, Jackie, the things that I'm working on with niche twins in this travel site won't be just SEO traffic. Uh, there will be other, okay. uh, other plays that are slower and more well-rounded because I want cash flow. I'd rather make three grand a month and feel good about that, that it's not going to go away tomorrow, then make, you know, 20 grand a month. And that might go away in two months. Uh, that's my mindset mm -hmm. now. And I also, I had a, a good win with this first site. So I kind of have the luxury of feeling that way and thinking that way now, but I do, I do believe that the lifespan on those types of sites are short now. Yeah, I, I generally would, would agree. Um, especially for informational keyword keywords. Um, Definitely need to diversify. I think what James is doing is great. Uh, I think he's doing it right. And he's, he, you're, you're getting into e-commerce. You're doing affiliate for other people, James. I think it's a good setup you have. Um, yeah, if I were to do everything all over again, man, it's tough to say. I'm, I'm glad I'm doing the newsletter right now, though. That That's kind of, that's going crazy. Uh, but man, if you know, if you're a sponsor... So what, what I'm seeing right now is that I might be charging too much per sponsorship. And that's like, like pushing people away for like these newsletter sponsors or like this podcast sponsor. And because we do get a lot of inbound, but like once I quote them, they're, they're just, they just run away. So I'm, I do know some of the other creators in the space, they're charging way too little. And if I think we can coordinate an attack on this industry, we're able can to like, you, I was just going to say, yeah. I was just going to say, Jackie, can you please DM me what your too high is? Cause I know what too little is. And if we, if you just meet somewhere in the middle, I, I do believe that there is a number that makes sense. Right. Obviously you want a number. That, a, yeah. Actually, you probably pushed, you did the right thing. You pushed up against where like people start to question you and then, you know, you're close. Right. Whereas if you price yeah. low, like I had someone send me more money than I asked for to cover my PayPal fees. That's how you know you're probably charging too low, right? They like just willingly sent me more. Um, and so, <laughs> so there's a balance. There. Yeah. Yeah. And you also, the thing is, uh, yeah, and you also, a lot of these contacts, the people who reach out, they're like people I know on Twitter. I don't want to screw them on like a too high of a fee. I want them to get like a return on their money. Right. Um, and we do have good case studies. So people have made their money back and way more. Uh, but yeah, just trying to, trying to find the, the good middle ground is tough. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm seeing a lot of case studies on Twitter right now. Are you seeing like marketing max? He's kind of popping off. He, he said he's going to hit 500 K this year on his newsletter business. And he only has like 20 K subs or something like that. I, I can easily do that. Uh, that's like I did pretty. I yeah. did see that. I think it's it's very interesting. I'm so like I am as green as it gets when it comes to newsletters, but I'm having fun with it. I think the easiest thing to do is just actually do great content and then at some point I do want to experiment like what you're doing Jackie with ads. I mean, I saw one of your ads had like 3 million impressions, which is just silly. <laughs> uh, and so I don't know what you paid for that ad, but I got to believe it was less than like what that would be worth, but I, I, I've resi I did a really stupid thing where I get, did like a cash giveaway and did not think it through very well. Um, stupid way to do it. But I do think if you took your community, so you have a Twitter following, Jackie, um, you built that off of sharing stuff about marketing. If you went private for 24 hours and the people that follow you and you did a cash giveaway or did something that maybe was a little bit less cheeky than that and you gave a little more value, it just had the people that already were interested in your thing. I actually think there's something there where you could spend a certain amount of money to your own audience by locking it down. So you're not going to get all these spammers like I got. I think there's something interesting there because they're already interested in you. They know you and they're interested in what you're sharing. And your newsletter aligns pretty well with that. 
So I, I'm still mm-hmm. interested in like, there's something there. The way I did it was stupid. Um, but there's a better way to do it. Um, Actually, I, it I, I was about to do it as device. well. I was about to do a giveaway as well. Um, seeing yours. <laughs> uh, what were the results from that? Like, what was the cost per the newsletter sign up in the end? Yeah, so I, I um, and again, this was like, a, I just texted Keith and was like, should we just give cash away and see what happens? It was 250 bucks. I said 500. I'm glad Keith was like, let's just try 250 and see what happens. Um, shout out to Keith, man. And two, 250, yeah, shout out to <laughs> Keith. He, he was like, like, let's just try something first with the lower amount. Um, we got 99 subs. So right off the bat, not that great. You said, you, you messaged me, Jackie. You know, you had a worse outcome maybe with the link thing, but I think long term that's going to do better for you. Um, so 99 subs, I sent an email immediately. I ended up getting a 55% open rate with those 99. Uh, it turned out the people that were spamming me on Twitter were lazy and didn't actually go to my site and then sign up. They just liked and retweeted to be entered into it, which is why you should lock down your profile for 24 hours, control your audience that you already have. And then I was that. thinking I think that's interesting. I was thinking it should just be newsletter signups. Like you have to be signed up to the newsletter to be eligible for this money. Did you say that? Because my internet cut so out. I said, so that's interesting. I said like and retweet because I, in my mind, Exposure, and this is how right? like poorly thought out this was. I was thinking <laughs> it was going to just go to the people that follow me, which is stupid. I, if I had private, if I made my account private for 24 hours, that would have made sense because then I would amplify it within my own audience and they're following me for a reason. And I don't tweet about what I ate. I tweet about like, you know, niche sites and what I built. So they're interested in what I'm saying. And I think they would be interested in my newsletter. Um, and so I said, like, retweet and subscribe. Um, and I, I think that you could probably just do, you know, you could play with it, but I, there is something there because those 99 subscribers actually, uh, decent open rate. My last email had like a 62% open rate. So that's not that far off these new subscribers, 99. Yeah. I just, I just paid too much for them. I think. Yeah. Dude, I think with your logic, you should just run retargeting ads on Twitter. You know, you can target people who've seen your tweets or followers <laughs> of you. It costs like a dollar to reach them all in like a yeah. day. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, you, you should check it out. Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting. To, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Twitter ads right now is in a good space. Um, it's, it feels like Facebook in its early days because people can't figure it because their ad manager sucks. It's, it's really hard to run ads on there, but it's the jankiness that gets you like lower CPAs. So um, I highly recommend to anyone who's listening here and just try out Twitter ads. Um, it's been good. It's been good. It's better than Facebook in a lot of cases. Yeah. 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 Based on that one tweet alone that you got popping off, I think that's worth it. I mean, it's not popping off. It's just, I, I spent a lot of it's money on that and that's it. Uh, but yeah, uh, general CPA was probably <laughs> like $4. That's, that's what I have to know. Yeah. It's about $4 yeah. US yeah, so- per newsletter sign up. And you get the add on effects. You get followers get that, from that as well. Right. Cause people see your ad. They're like, what the hell is this? They'll follow you. So if you, I don't count that. as So a I read this. I wish I could shout this guy out. Cause I, I actually can't think of his Twitter account, but he had worked on the hustle milk road and a number of other very big newsletters. Oh, I know. Um, and he had a very interesting thread. Do you know who his name is? Cause he, he, he's an interesting follow. Um, he had Matt McGarry. basically, he said, yes. And he basically said like, Hey, the thing that they don't want you to know is the way they grow these newsletters to be so big is they pay for them. And that makes sense to me. Like to get to that size, you're paying a certain amount. So say you pay four or three, whatever the number is per subscriber, but you make 10 on the lifetime value of that customer, whatever you want to call it. Um, then that, that math works great, right? Your margin is pretty good there. Um, and then I think Sam Parr responded to that and said, partly true. You know, we grew, at least in the case of the hustle, they organically grew to 100,000 subscribers before they ever paid for subscribers. Um, And I think there's something to that, too, where I do think there's a threshold of, like, 
organic goodwill. Like you actually have a product that's working and that people want. Mm -hmm. And you, your proof is you didn't have to pay them to get them. And then you take, and then that's your proof the model's working. And then you kind of lean in a bit with cash to say, this is working with this group of people and whatever your number, maybe that number's 5,000 for you. Maybe it's 10,000, maybe it's 100,000. I think Sam would probably have done it earlier if he knew how successful it was uh, to do that. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Um, anyways. Um, I was going to say that. Like, yeah. I think Sam, Sam's a smart guy, um, but I think they started way too late. That's why they're not as big as the Morning Brew right now. Um, but I think based on what he said, first 100K, he was doing like stupid growth hacks that took too long. He could have just paid for it, honestly, right? Imagine totally, like, totally. you know, the time spent on his employees, his own time, he's valuing it as zero, right? I'm guessing, but all this is cost. Employees are cost. Employee time is cost, you know, so on and so forth. So yeah, I think- 100%. 100%. I, we'll, we'll have to see where this uh, industry goes. I. I know we're running overtime, but I'll, I guess I'll leave this on this note. Um, a lot of people are entering the newsletter space right now. And what's going to happen is unless we talk, <laughs> like coordinate within ourselves, there's, it's going to be a race to the bottom. Someone will always be taking like a lower uh, rate of sponsorship and <clears throat> it'll be a race to the bottom. So what will happen in a free market is uh, sponsorship pricing and ad rates for like CPA uh, paid ad rates would normalize. So they'll meet somewhere in the middle where like, it makes just a bit of sense to be running this business, but not enough for <clears throat> like smaller players to enter. Cause it like, it doesn't make sense. If you're trying, you have like 2000 followers, you're not, you're not trying to sell like a hundred dollar sponsorship all day, every day, you know? Um, so it's like, it's going to be really tough to enter. The so I agree that if you, control the variables for what you just said yes but the reality is you know ads are probably the lowest denominator monetization in the future right the best case scenario is you're selling a physical or, or better yet a digital product that you own that you're constantly mm -hmm. pumping out mm -hmm. to your audience and so ads are a component to newsletter the newsletter business and i agree 100 percent with everything you said but the reality is your goal should be I don't want to even rely on ads like ads will be kind of the cherry on on each newsletter I send. I want to rely on pumping out my own products or whatever it may be or services or whatever. Yeah, I agree. Actually, um, if you have your own products, that's you're golden. I think uh, what Mushfiq is doing is very smart. Um, yeah, selling his own services like m and services, content services, so on and so forth. Smart, smart. Um, yeah, we'll see how I uh, move forward here. Because the thing is, with con uh, with sponsorships, it's immediate. It's cash flow, right? You get your money back immediately from the ads that you spent from the previous weeks. So yeah, we'll we'll see. We'll see how I'll, I'll obviously be testing everything. I'll be trying to report as much as I can in public, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, but newsletter seems but all the have, hype right now. You have in the a niche service, space. right, Jackie? It, it is. It's yeah. weird how that happened. Like I just, yeah. I had sold my website and then I was like, what's the quickest thing I can start to work on? I have a lot of stuff to talk about now because of that sale newsletter made sense, but it does feel like everything is newsletter focused at the moment. Um, you know, but I think, I think people are realizing with all these updates and with AI, no one can take your newsletter away from you. And people have been saying this for years. So they're probably rolling their eyes and they're like, you guys are, you know, you guys are way behind on this. But it's true. You start to get this sense of like, when I wake up in the morning, I'm not checking some thing on my screen to see if my subscribers are still there. Like they're not, unless something crazy happens, you know, I have that audience. So I, I do think people are coming more and more. They're realizing that's very valuable. Yeah, that's true. And to answer your question, yeah, I do have services, um, but everything's already automated. So I'm starting to like add them in to each email, uh, everything's in an automated series. So like, I have like a hello, how's it going? Uh, I have a podcast push on the second email. I have a third one. It's like, hey, uh, you need help with SEO, book a time. Um, if not, if it's out of your budget, buy some backlinks. Like that's the type of flow. Um, yeah, it's pretty well set up right now, I would say. Uh, and in every email, there's like sections that I pitch myself, so on and so forth. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how um, things go.
the the link building side is growing nicely because of the newsletter, but I don't really want to rely on link building. It's like, it's not the greatest uh, thing to sell. I think a full service SEO is a lot better because you're able to grasp onto all, all the variables, right? You don't have to rely on them creating good content, which most of the time clients don't. <laughs> yeah. That is the hardest part, right? Content. And that, that's also the other thing where I think about like, if you, if I were to build or you know, do something where I sold it, the, the thing that is hardest in my opinion is like how you create content. So for example, the brand swapping method, that was just me saying like, Hey, I'm not an expert. Here's the thing I'm doing and it's working very well right now. And those types of things, maybe they work today. Maybe they don't work tomorrow. And creating content is kind of like that, where there are certain things like keyword research, for example, you're either good at that or you're not right. Like either you're good at keyword research or you're not very good at it. And if you're not very good at it, your content can be amazing and you're still going to fail for very, for obvious reasons. Um, and so there's certain things where you can like pick out, like, do I want to focus here or do I want to focus on the thing um, that either works or doesn't? And it's kind of hard to argue against it. Whereas like good content, it's like, you know, James will say that stinks and Jackie might say that's good. And it's like, okay, well, how do we decide, yeah. right? What's good or what's not? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I mean, what's good, what, what's good, I guess, is what ranks right at the moment. So I guess we'll, we just check the front page of Google for the most, like the yeah, highest quality sure. of content. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, hey, Mike, I, I, we're, we're, we're running over time, but uh, thanks for your time today, man. I really appreciate you hopping on. Where, where can people find you? You know, plug yourself. Yeah, Let's go. thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks, James. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so we, you can find me now on Twitter at Niche Down um, and then also at NicheTwins.com. Uh, and we have a newsletter going out every Friday morning at 830 Eastern time. I'm going to keep that going as long as I can. But I appreciate talking to you. It's nice meeting you, uh, Jackie, James. You and I spoke before. Um, but good yep. talking to you too. And, um, J uh, Jackie, you got to get better internet in Bali, man. Terrible. <laughs> Dude, I know. his internet everywhere he goes. <laughs> it's like, a, already, it's like uh, a 15 second delay. Yeah. I already Karen the front desk. It will, hopefully it comes out. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Cheers.